Hvis jeg kender noget hæfik, og kan sige, her kan jeg købe en bolle og klæde her hæve. Det er min lund folk, jeg vil have et kønt publik og lade en jo. Vi har for Dublin North East Remembers, og The Connelly Media Group, jeg vil like to velkomme os alle her til dagens til, 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 til publik lektion om den russiske revolution. Uh, today's talk, as I said, is also being put on in conjunction with the Connolly Media Group. Um, Air Committee is a local committee here in Dublin North East. It was, it was put together in October 2015 as a broad-based, non-party political um, committee. Um, our aim was to highlight the 1916 centenary celebrations within our own community here in Dublin North East, in particular in the Kulak area, by putting on um, talks like today's um, film showings, tours, mural and violence, and uh, fundraising functions. Um, after the centenary year, we, 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 did, we did a very successful year, we, we did a lot of meetings which we usually put on in the library up there up the road, um, which were full, most of them were fairly full. And um, We decided to keep the committee going um, right through the decade of remembrance here, right up to the Tan War and the, and the Civil War and put on all different key events. So this is our fourth sort of foray into international type uh, um, affairs, so what better one to start with than um, the world's first probably successful socialist. Um, revolution of the, of the 20th century. Um, we have two speakers here today, uh, Donald Fallon I'm going to introduce now and Jimmy from the Connie Media Group is going to talk a bit about the Connie Media Group and introduce our second speaker Eddie Glacken um, after Donald. Donald has been with us a couple of times here before in Dublin North East, done a number, number of lectures for us. Um, he's a well-known Dublin historian who appears regularly on News Talk and uh, hold that against me. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> is, is a well-known blogger on the Come Here, Here To Be blog and book and has wrote a book on um, John McBride and the 1916 Rising and he appeared in the Late Late Show last night as well. <laughs> so, he, 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 he was on about, it was a far cry from this, it was plates of pictures of the Pope and, 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 and plates with, with JFK and stuff on it but Sherlock. You have, to, you have to earn your few quid down, I suppose, you know? <laughs> so, look, uh, we'll get the ball rolling and uh, give down a big round of applause and Jimmy will introduce you. Uh, <laughs> the Pope, JFK and other such reactionaries. Uh, I'm very grateful uh, for the invite to be here again. Fantastic facilities. I've never been here before uh, in the Parnell JA Club. I wish we had such things in the League of Ireland. And I think the <laughs> laptop... <laughs> The laptop is haunted by the ghost of some Menshevik, but we'll try our best and see if we, if we get through this. Uh, earlier this year, the decision of Dublin City Council to set aside €30,000 to mark the centenary of the Russian Revolution was controversial. Young Fine Gael called on the City Council to, quote, abandon its plans to commemorate the October 1917 tragedy. The Times newspaper gave space to both views on the matter in an article that was entitled, Dublin Keeps the Red Flag Flying. But regardless of what you think about the Russian Revolution, the influence of events in Russia on revolutionary, on revolutionary Ireland were enormous. On the 4th of February 1918, thousands of people gathered at the Mansion House on Dawson Street, a police estimate is 10,000 people, to herald the birth of the new Russian Republic and to, quote, congratulate the Russian people on the triumph they've won for democratic principles. The Irish Independent proclaimed that the scene in the round room was an extraordinary one. The passage up to the centre of the spacious and crowded floor was occupied by a dense body of men. It had all the trappings of a socialist meeting even today. Near the front of the body was borne aloft a red flag, and during an interval in proceedings, the red flag was sung with gusto. Now, in recent years, there's been a, a very positive move, I think, towards looking at the Irish Revolution in a much broader kind of international sense. And we can only really understand the history of the 1913 to 23 period in Ireland when we do that. We need to look at what was happening in other places and how Ireland was impacted by those things. Karl Liebknecht, uh, the, the communist leader who'd bring out the Spartacists in Germany, in 1919, Karl Liebknecht said that the Russian Revolution was the outcome of the proletariat of the whole world becoming more militant. And in April 1919, the very unlikely figure of Eamon de Valera called on Ireland to readier herself for a day, quote, when Europe might be run by councils of soldiers, workers and peasants. Now, the intersections of Irish nationalism and Russian communism in the revolutionary period are sometimes very surprising. But in truth, the revolutionary forces that brought about the Bolshevik seizure of power were aware of what was happening in Ireland for some time. Now, buried in the pages of the Bureau of Military History witness statements, the historian Morris J. Casey unearthed the incredible claims of Patrick Little, who was a prominent nationalist journalist, that a number of leading Bolsheviks had in fact visited Dublin in the aftermath of the 1916 Rising, including Ivan Maisky, who later became the Soviet Union's ambassador to Britain. Little maintained that two of the four Russians who visited Dublin were in fact killed in the violence that followed the Russian Revolution. And to quote his witness statement, he said, quote, 
The Russians came to Dublin to study the revolution and especially the work of James Connolly. Russia hadn't yet brought about their revolution. They knew former revolutions had been carried out by manning the barricades in the street, but the Irish strategy was new. The taking of houses in, in key positions interested them greatly. The Sydney Street siege in London, where one man with a gun held out against a regiment of soldiers and then Mr Churchill, had also set a new example. These Russians were revolutionaries, not yet pronounced communists at the time. Now, Patrick Little's claims that there were Russians in Dublin in 1916 are backed up by other sources as well. There's a 1918 article in the journal New Ireland, which was a, a Sinn Féin-affiliated publication that talks about the visit. Ada Blockham, who later became a, a raging anti-communist, he wrote a pamphlet called What Sinn Féin Stands For, in which he talked about this visit as well. It's an interesting little footnote in the story of the Rising. I think Morris Casey is right when he says it's actually it's highly unlikely that the Bolshevik upper echelons were either aware or particularly concerned with the visit. At the time, there was a community of Russian political exiles in London, and the delegates who travelled to Dublin were almost certainly selected from that cadre. Now, whatever about people visiting Dublin, certainly the events in Dublin did impact on the thinking of leading socialists, including Vladimir Lenin. And the slaughter of the First World War, which had shamefully been supported, we should never forget this, by much of the workers' movement, who rallied behind their respective national forces, it opened up a very wide number of political debates in Europe. And among people like Lenin, who opposed the barbarism of the First World War, the question of what policy should be adopted towards national liberation struggles was very much ongoing. So this idea of the national question, you know, it divided socialists across Europe. And some, including Rosa Luxemburg, who was right about almost everything but wrong about this, rejected the idea that national self-determination could serve as a, pros a positive source towards revolutionary change. Lenin, though, took a very different view. Lenin was developing his own critique of imperialism, and he utilised the Easter Rising in his own framework. As imperialist powers in Europe continued to struggle for domination on the continent, Lenin understood the significance of what had happened in Dublin, and he placed it within the context of the global British Empire when he wrote, quote, the struggle of the oppressed nations in Europe, the struggle capable of going all the way to insurrection and street fighting, capable of breaking down the iron discipline of the army and martial law, will sharpen the revolutionary crisis in Europe to an infinitely greater degree than a much more developed rebellion in some remote colony. A blow delivered against the power of the English imperialist bourgeoisie by a rebellion in Ireland is a hundred times more significant politically than a blow of equal force delivered in Asia or in Africa. Now, Vladimir Lenin maintained that the centuries-old Irish national movement had, quote, manifested itself in street fighting conducted by a section of the urban petty bourgeoisie and a section of the workers after a long period of mass agitation, demonstrations, suppressions of newspapers, etc. Whoever calls this rebellion a putsch is either a hardened reactionary or a doctrinaire hopelessly incapable of envisaging a social revolution as a living phenomenon. You want to talk about revolution, Lenin argued this is one. Now, not all Russian radical voices embraced the events of the Easter Rising, even critically. Uh, Plekhanov would describe the Rising as being, quote, positively harmful, while Karl Reddick went even further. He maintained that, quote, this movement, Sinn Féin, is a purely urban, petty, bourgeois movement, and although it caused considerable commotion, it had little social backing. When its hopes for German assistance led it to revolt, this amounted only to a putsch that the British government easily disposed of. Trotsky challenged those kind of responses to the Rising, and while acknowledging the imperfect nature of the revolutionary forces in Dublin, he also expressed great hope, even maintaining that the events in Dublin could influence the British working class. He wrote that the historical role of the Irish proletariat is only beginning. Already into this uprising, under an archaic banner, it's injected its class resentment against militarism and imperialism. That resentment from now on will not subside. On the contrary, it will find an echo throughout Great Britain. Scottish soldiers smash the Dublin barricades, but in Scotland itself, coal miners are rallying around the red flag. By November 1917, by the 9th of November, days after it all began, the enormity of what had actually occurred in Russia was starting to dawn on the Irish media, but they struggled to get reports from the ground. The Freeman's Journal reprinted some absolutely ludicrous stuff, uh, including the claim of a German newspaper that, quote, the consequences will be incalculable if the power of the Russian state is really passed into the hands of the Bolsheviks. Lenin rule means proletarian bloodshed for Russia. The conservative Daily Express, who were absolutely horrified by what was happening in Russia, but they were hopeful that the outed government would regain control. They wrote, quote, Events occur with such dramatic suddenness in Russia that the observer is somewhat bewildered by the rapidity, but in the wireless news now to hand is to be relied upon, it would appear that the good sense of the bulk of the Russian people is beginning to assert itself again. Now, the mainstream press were absolutely horrified by what was happening, but in nationalist publications, the revolution in Russia was very quickly championed. So we should ask ourselves, what was it about the Bolshevik revolution that appealed to Irish nationalists? I think the biggest thing, to be honest, was the desire of the revolutionary forces in Russia to pull their country out of the war. And as far as Irish nationalists were concerned, that would be a body blow to the British Empire. Frank Robbins, who was in the Irish Citizen Army, he recalled that to him and his comrades, we regarded events in Russia, quote, 
as being the end of Russian participation in the war, and thus we visualised Britain's defeat as almost certain, and our independence as a nation was in sight. I think when Britain later intervened in the Russian Civil War, that in such a disastrous fashion, I think that also influenced how Irish nationalists looked at this new state. And Patrick McCartan, who was essentially kind of Sinn Féin's ambassador to the United States, he said that the mass of our people were friendly to communist Russia, not because they understood that Russia was communist or what communism meant, but because they saw England endeavouring to overthrow the regime there. I think Emmett O'Connor is right when he says, you know, one reason the Russian Revolution was so popular in Ireland, quote, it was so broadly popular, because it meant whatever the left wanted it to mean. Now, chief to seize upon it were the trade union leaders in Dublin. And as Emmett O'Connor has noted, the Bolshevik Revolution gave a timely opportunity to the leaders of the Irish trade unions to give expressions to their political aspirations. Irish trade unionism in 1970 and 1918 is exploding. It's going through this enormous resurgence. Padraig Yates describes it as Lazarus-like. You know, by the end of 1917, influenced by the wartime economy, the ITGWU membership stood at 25,000 people, which was just remarkable for a body who had less than 5,000 people in their ranks on the eve of the Easter Rising. William O'Brien, the Labour Party and trade union leader, heralded the meeting or the, re the revolution in Russia at a meeting of the Trade Union Congress, attempting to link what had happened in Russia to events in Ireland. He said that when James Connolly laid down his life for the Irish working class, he laid it down for the working class in all countries. He believed that an example of action had to be given to the workers to spur them to resistance to the powers of imperialism and capitalism, which plunged Europe into a war of empire and conquest. We know that influence is exercised among those great men and women who've given us the Russian Revolution. So there's people like William O'Brien and the future leader of the Labour Party, Thomas Johnson, and other people of their ilk, who orchestrated the first kind of direct contact with representatives of the new Russian state. And a lot of that happened in Russia, uh, sorry, in London. William O'Brien caused a stir. He spoke at a convention of socialist labour and cooperative movements held in Leeds in June 1918. And when he spoke that day, he compared unfavourably the attitudes of British leftists towards the Russian Revolution with their attitudes towards insurrection in Ireland. He said that, I gather from reading some of the capitalist newspapers that revolution is popular nowadays. 12 months ago, we had a revolution in Ireland. And the politicians that acclaimed the revolution in Russia had, did not acclaim the revolution there. The leaders were taken out and shot like dogs. Within the pages of Irish Opinion, a newspaper that was edited by O'Brien's close comrade Thomas Johnson, the Bolsheviks were heralded for seeking to pull Russia out of the slaughter of the war. And the newspaper wrote, Labour in Russia was and is honest. In consequence, it has given to the world a formula which is what a SARS throne to be given. No annexations and the right of every nation to determine its own destiny. Beside that formula, the greatest military victories are of nothing. That formula must be ultimately triumphant. Now, it was William O'Brien and Thomas Johnson who were central to bringing about the meeting in the Mansion House in February 1918. And that meeting was intended very much as a public expression of sympathy with the aims and objectives of the Russian Revolution. At that meeting, Countess Markovitch spoke. She expressed the support of the Irish Citizen Army for the new Russian state. The Irish Citizen Army in 1917 is a very interesting organisation. In fact, it's back really, it's much more visible on the streets in 1917 and 1918 than the Irish volunteers are, who are still reorganising themselves behind the scenes. One reason for that probably is that the Irish volunteers were a nationwide organisation. The Citizen Army in many ways are more restricted to Dublin, and particular parts of Dublin. This picture is taken in 1917 on the first anniversary of the Easter Rising, and it shows the Citizen Army gathered outside Liberty Hall. You see Liberty Hall is still damaged, still battle damaged from the Easter Rising. Some familiar faces in this picture. Uh, Winifred Kearney, James Connolly's secretary, is here, for example. The pools can be identified in the front row. Dr. Kathleen Lynn uh, is there as well. So the Citizen Army makes one of its first reappearances in, in public, in uniform, at this meeting to celebrate the Russian Revolution. The Citizen Army had a very keen sense of internationalism during the War of Independence. On one occasion, they were actually inspected at Dolphin's Barn by Willie Gallagher, who was later a Communist Party MP at Westminster, and the Welsh Communist, Arthur Horner, who uh, later became the president of the National Union of Mine Workers. He was a member of the Irish Citizen Army between 1917 and 1918. He said he traveled to join the Citizen Army on the basis that, quote, the Citizen Army which Connolly created represented to me the only possible struggle of movement of the working class aimed at economic as well as political freedom. Now, some remarkable people pop up at this meeting in the Mansion House. That's Thomas Johnson uh, of the Labour Party. And this guy, just a fascinating figure of history, Conrad Peterson, who describes himself at the meeting as a Russian social democrat. He was a remarkable figure. At the age of 17, he took part in the Russian Revolution of 1905. In the aftermath, he was forced to flee to Dublin, and he was active in socialist and Irish Republican politics in Dublin uh, between 1906 and 1919. 
He spoke in the Mansion House, quote, in support of the great struggle for peace, liberty and bread. Now, perhaps fearful of the scenes of enthusiasm, and there were great scenes of enthusiasm in the Mansion House, the Irish Times warned that, quote, Bolshevism is creeping into Ireland. They have invaded this country. And if the democracies don't keep their heads, they may extend to other countries in Europe. Thomas Johnson, who we saw a minute ago, briefly should be spoken about here. He was born in Liverpool to Irish parents in May 1872. He was leader of the Labour Party for 10 years, from 1917 to 1927. And in many ways, he's remembered as a very reformist political figure and, and not a revolutionary. Uh, in 1925, in the Dáil, he stood up and this kind of sums up his political philosophy. He said, shall our aim be, honestly, to remove poverty? Or are we going to agitate and organise with the objective of waging some class war and use the unemployed and the poverty of the workers as propagandist cries to justify our actions? I don't think this view of the mission of the labour movement has any promise or ultimate usefulness in Ireland. You know, Johnson was very much a reformist. But in 1980, and maybe because of the mood of the time, there's a very different Johnson, a very radicalised Johnson, who's looking at the events in Russia with great hope and optimism. He wrote a newspaper, he wrote an article in the newspaper Irish Opinion, which he edited entitled, If the Bolsheviks Came to Ireland. And in it he said, the great gathering of Dublin citizens at the Mansion House to acclaim the social revolution in Russia is a sign to all parties in Ireland that the people are in demanding independence and not going to be satisfied with a mere political change, no matter how drastic. What they need and what they're coming to recognise they need is a change of social and economic relations. A lot of what he wrote in that article, you know, it resonates today. He wrote that if the Bolsheviks came to Ireland, quote, the land of the country will be made free of access to those who are willing to cultivate it in the best communal advantage. The Dublin housing problem, imagine that, the Dublin housing problem, will be immediately tackled and might be made less pressing by a distribution of the congested population from the tenements over the partially occupied mansions of the suburbs. Now, the most important contacts, I think, between representatives of Revolutionary Ireland and Russia, it wasn't really Johnson or O'Brien or anyone like them. It happened in America. In America, Sinn Féin had a very strong network who were seeking recognition for the fledgling Irish Republic, but were also trying to establish contacts with just about any kind of separatists that they could. You had some veterans of the 1916 Rising who had to get out of Ireland uh, in New York, including Liam Mellows, who's shown at the back of this group. Mellows had led the Rising uh, in Galway. And Mellows, the voice of Labour newspaper in Dublin proclaimed, was a champion of the cause of Russia. They wrote that, quote, Almost every message we get from America tells us how strongly an old friend, Liam Mellows, stands up for the Russian fighters for freedom. The FBI were very frightened of connections between radicalised Irish America and the Bolsheviks. Big Jim Larkin's FBI file in April 1919 quotes Larkin himself as saying, the Soviet government of Russia is an ideal one and I'm ready to live for it, work for it, and if needs be, I'll die for it. Get ready, marshal your hearts and get a disciplined army. Michael Quinn's excellent recent study on Irish-Soviet diplomatic relations demonstrates that the Russians took a very active interest in Larkin in America. Larkin was his own man with his own gospel and his own unique brand of political philosophy. But while Larkin was imprisoned, he was actually elected symbolically in February 1922 to the Moscow Soviet. The most important man in America as far as Irish-Russian relations were concerned was Patrick McCartan, Dr. Patrick McCartan. Very conservative in his political views, he was a fellow of the College of Surgeons. He was an active IRB man. He was a brilliant networker and communicator. And as early as January 1919, he was putting feelers out to the Russians. The Sinn Féin newspaper New Ireland wrote that, quote, McCartan's views are very strong upon the importance of using the Russian democratic programme for the benefit of Ireland and of allying ourselves with Russian Democrats and with real Democrats throughout the world. McCartan actually travels to Russia in the early stages of 1921. He was sent there to secure recognition for the Irish Republic and it's been maintained to actually try and procure arms, which was very, very important. Months earlier, there was actually a proposed treaty drawn up in the US between, quote, the Russian Socialist Federal Soviet Republic and the Republic of Ireland. Now, a copy of this was captured in Dublin, and it was eventually distributed to members of the Westminster Parliament and throughout the press. Oh, pardon me, a bit ahead of myself, and throughout the press. E.H. Carr, who's a leading historian of the Bolsheviks, he maintains that the negotiations on that treaty were never taken too seriously by either side. And I think he's a little too dismissive. The treaty that's drawn up between the Soviets uh, and the Irish Republicans is, is, is quite interesting. Just a few quotes from it. It says, one, the government of the Russian Socialist Federal Soviet Republic pleasures, its, pleasures itself, its resources and its influence to promote the recognition of the sovereignty of the Republic of Ireland by the nations of the world. 
Then it says, quote, the government of the Russian Socialist Federal Soviet Republic undertakes to exert pressures on any nation, organization, or groups of people with whom it has influence to prevent the shipment of arms, munitions, and military supplies intended for use against the Republic of Ireland. And then rather strangely, it says, the government of the Russian Socialist Federal Soviet Republic accords to all religious denominations represented in the Republic of Ireland every right accorded to religious sects by the Russian constitution and entrusts to the accredited representatives of the Republic of Ireland in Russia the interests of, Roman Catholic, of the Roman Catholic Church within the territory of the Russian Socialist Federal Soviet Republic. McCartan spent quite a lot of time in Russia actually and he had a number of very frank meetings uh, and he sent memorandums back to Dublin which actually, actually survive. I think McCartan grew very very frustrated when he was in Russia there was endless de uh, diplomatic dead ends that seemed to surround his trip. And Britain was kind of moving towards a trade agreement with the new Russian state. Now, the British had tried everything in their power to overthrow the Soviets, and when they realised they weren't going anywhere, this would be a better deal with them. And I think the fact that this was going on behind the scenes influenced how the Russians dealt with McCartan. His letters back to de Valera in Dublin are very, very bitter. In one letter he writes, the idea of whether or not the present regime represents the will of the people is openly laughed at. They do, however, claim that the present government is a dictatorship of the proletariat, and they justify it on the grounds that dictatorship is essential during what is called the transitional period. That is, in the case of Russia, the change from feudalism to communism. They state frankly that communism doesn't yet exist in Russia, but that they're traveling along the road to communism. No one that I've happened to meet was prepared to discuss whether or not the tyrannical road along which they were at present walking was certain to lead to the ideal liberty as understood by communism. He wasn't a socialist of any description, McCartan. He was very, very conservative in his views. But his visit to Russia was motivated entirely by Irish concerns, and it remains an important and overlooked intersection of two stories. As Arthur Morgan has put it, it encapsulates the moment, a very strange moment, when a national revolution on the western edge of, our, of, of Europe came into contact with the international proletarian revolution in the East. Now, if we're talking about Ireland and the Bolsheviks, we should ask ourselves, who are the Irish Bolsheviks? Uh, undoubtedly, that honour doesn't go to Thomas Johnson or William O'Brien. That honour lies with the small band of radicals built around Sean McLaughlin, Roddy Connolly, who's shown here, Paddy Stevenson, and other veterans of the 1916 Rising, who were instrumental in bringing about the first Communist Party. Wrestling political influence away from people like O'Brien and Johnson, J uh, Roddy Connolly actually travels to, Peter to Petrograd in 1920 with Eamon McAlpin, a very daunting and very dangerous journey over land and sea, and it was there that he actually met Vladimir Lenin personally. I think this is one of the defining images uh, of the revolutionary period in Ireland. It's a remarkable image. At the Second Congress of the Communist International, Roddy Connolly gave a very important, a very honest outline of where he felt Ireland was. It's quite stark, to be honest, uh, about the Citizen Army. He said, on its reorganisation after the release of prisoners in December 1917, the Citizen Army retained its proletarian basis, but as the situation is now dominated by the IRA and the primary leaders of the Citizen Army were killed, it steadily weakened and is now more or less, uh, sorry, and is now no longer an effective influence on Irish political life. The ICA programme is the establishment by force of arms of a workers' republic in Ireland, that a form and structure of such a republic are not consciously understood by the majority of its members. Though it was very numerically small, Connolly, McLaughlin and others established the first Communist Party of Ireland, which was a real break from reformism. While Johnson, O'Brien and others tried to remain aloof from events in Ireland like the Civil War, this Communist Party took a very principled stand about imperialism. Writing on the outbreak of civil war, quote, victory lies with the side that can attract itself to the masses, the workers of the towns and cities and the landless peasants. Republicans, here is your chance. With the workers behind you, the free state lapses into the blank hell, the black hell from where it came. Now in time, the press denunciation of communism grew very, very strong indeed. And by 1919, there was very hysteric denunciations appearing in sections of the Irish press, the Belfast press, and in particular, the ever-reliable Irish Independent. And this no doubt hampered the ability of communists to organise in Ireland. The Independent repeated the claims of a Catholic bishop that, quote, it's a matter of notoriety that James Connolly was in touch with the Russian Bolsheviks before the insurrection in Ireland, and that the idea was to make an experiment of Russian social ideals. What these people were trying to do at Easter 1916 was to bring about the same kind of disorder as the revolution in Russia has done. The Belfast Newsletter wrote, late in 1919, that the direction of labour in Ireland has sadly passed entirely into the hands of Connollyites and Bolsheviks. Now, beyond the, if only, uh, beyond the <laughs> hype of the press, British authorities were quite fearful, actually, uh, of Irish nationalist and communist collaboration. Uh, in October 1921, Sir Basil Thompson, always a voice of moderation, he told the cabinet that Irish radicals, quote, were trying to encourage all anti-British revolutionaries to emulate the methods of Sinn Féin. The proof of British fear of Irish-Soviet relations came in this report. 
uh, intercourse between Bolshevism and Sinn Féin, which was presented to the House of Commons, and in a very sensationalist little book called Red Terror and Green, which was published both in London and New York, written by Richard Dawson, designed to frighten the general public. Now, one very clear influence of the Russian Revolution on Irish political life was terminology. Between 1917 and 1923, and it's a story for another day, but it's important, over 100 workplace occupations in Ireland were labelled Soviets, something Emmett O'Connor has noted was, quote, substantially a strike tactic. In all cases, employers' property was handed back in return for wage increases. Even so, the Soviets indicated a political ambition. And they also indicate that that term, even the word Soviet, was in mainstream political discourse. Now, it's undoubtedly clear that the revolutionary events in Russia in 1917 impacted on the political consciousness of revolutionary Ireland. And I think recent scholarship continues to challenge the myth, which was put forward by free state political leader Kevin O'Higgins, that the Irish were, to quote him, the most conservative revolutionaries that ever put through a successful revolution. You know, the role of the left and the workers' movement is received in greater study than ever before. The failures of that movement, and they were many, must be acknowledged, but so too must its ambitions and achievements. In attempting to shape the Irish Revolution into a class-based revolution, they understood that was the only kind which could win in any meaningful way. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Donald. That was an excellent presentation there. Um, I think it's amazing to think that it was uh, 10,000 people gathered in Dublin to celebrate the Russian Revolution back in 1917. Uh, we'd already formed the first working class army in the world, in the Irish Citizens Army. And unfortunately, when the state was formed in the 20s, the counter-revolution set in and uh, they destroyed the state and it has ended up what it is today, with 8,000 people homeless on our streets. Um, I'm from the Connolly Media Group. The Connolly Media Group is an independent media group um, and we focus on uh, international and local news items on a progressive nature. Uh, we're linked to the Connolly Bookshop. Uh, it would be our literary wing, I suppose. There's plenty of books over there on sale today. Um, our next speaker is, um, as Donna referred to, who are the Irish Bolsheviks? Well, Eddie Glacken <laughs> would be one of those Irish Bolsheviks. Not that old. Well, <laughs> do the max. He's in the party 50 years next year, and he was involved in the Condé Youth movement before that. He was instrumental in the unification of the, the two wings of the Communist Youth Movement in Ireland, um, the Young Communist League in Northern Ireland, and the Connolly Youth Movement in the South in 1970, and he amalgamated to, before actually the Communist Party of Ireland did, in 1970. Uh, Eddie was, uh, worked as various jobs from a, a farm labourer in North County Dublin, to a road sweeper and a bin man here in Dublin. And uh, he's in good standing, as James Condy was a road sweeper in Edinburgh, and Ho Chi Minh was a road sweeper in <laughs> Paris. So uh, he's, he's of a good, uh, a good pedigree. Um, he was uh, active in the um, Federated Workers' Union of Ireland in the uh, Dublin Corporation and eventually became a full-time official with them. Um, he, um, put the glasses on. Uh, so he's going to explain to us here today uh, for the audience what the Russian Revolution actually was and give a sense of what it was about and what it felt like to be in uh, at the birth of the Soviet Union. So I'll ask you all to put your hands together for Eddie <laughs> Thanks, Jimmy. Afternoon, friends and comrades. Um, Folly da. I was afraid of this coming up that I'd have to follow after Donald with all this <laughs> flashing lights and slides and everything else. So I, I'm the proverbial talking head. About 200 years old, I think, but the calculation that Jimmy, Jimmy has given me. I'm close enough in 70, and that's as far as I want to go. The first thing to note about the Russian Revolution is that there wasn't one revolution, but two in Russia in 1917. And to confuse things further, the first one is referred to as the February Revolution, and the second one is referred to as the October Revolution. The February Revolution took place in March, and the October Revolution took place in November. Now, I hope you're with me so far. <laughs> they used to use the old Julian calendar, they call it, in Russia, and they changed over to the Gregorian calendar in 1918. There was 12, 13 days of a difference. So what in Russia they called the Great October Socialist Revolution, by air reckoning happened on the 7th of November 1917. And the February Revolution kicked off very auspiciously on the 8th of March, International Women's Day, um, in, uh, in 1917. But 
Let's talk a bit of the background. I'd say one th health warning, I suppose, before we kick in. Eugene McCartan gave me a, a web link here to an article by a comedy called Vijay Prashad, India, a couple of weeks ago. And he's talking about the Russian Revolution. He describes it as a revolutionary of ordinary people. He says, Lenin did not make the revolution in 1917, nor did Stalin, nor did Trotsky. They each provided crucial leadership, with Lenin's role being essential from April 1917 onwards. But they were part of a tidal wave that had first risen in 1905, crested and then rose again during the Great War. This tidal wave was lifted by ordinary people, factory workers, landless peasants, housewives, soldiers, students, and those who barely found the means to survive. It is they who made the revolution happen in February, with the overthrow of the Tsar and Tsarism, and then again in October, with the push against the insincere and indecisive parliamentary government of Alexander Kerensky. I'm just putting that in as a health warning because if you're expecting to hear me talking lots of stuff about Lenin and Stalin and Trotsky and you know, the great leaders of the revolution, you won't. I think the focus of it, the most significant thing about the Russian revolution as a, as a series of events is that it was driven by the masses of the ordinary people. For centuries, Ever since society first divided into classes of rulers and exploited, the exploited and oppressed have struggled to overthrow the power of their masters. This manifests itself in every age and every form of class society, whether we're talking about the heroic slave revolt led by Spartacus against the mighty Roman Empire, peasant revolts of the 14th century in England and France, other peasant revolts in what is now Germany and in Bohemia, the Great French Revolution, the most significant of all, perhaps, in more recent times, was the experience of the Paris Commune during the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-71, which was avidly studied by Marx, Engels and Lenin, and from which they learned many lessons in terms of the conduct of a revolution. But our subject today is Russia. The Russian Empire, vast but backward, had been dominated by the autocratic Roman dynasty for three centuries. Under the autocracy, supported by landowning nobility and the Orthodox Church, Russia was a bastion of reaction known as the prison house of nations, and during the 19th century as the gendarme of Europe. It used its military power to prop up and restore absolute monarchs in the wake of the French Revolution and to help defeat popular revolutions in Central and Eastern Europe in 1848. Russia had no representative political structures, no democratic organisations, an enslaved peasantry, but was in every sense a brutal police state. The Crimean War of 1853 to 1856 brought to a head the fact that Russia, notwithstanding its huge population and vast territory, was in no position to compete with the major powers of Britain and France. In fact, at the time of the Crimean War, Russia was still largely a feudal country, the serfs not being emancipated until 1861, and then with severe restrictions. It's interesting to consider the rationale behind the proposed emancipation of the serfs, as enunciated by Tsar Alexander in 1856, in the speech to the nobility of Moscow. He said, but of course, you yourselves realize the existing system of serf owning cannot remain unchanged. It is better to begin abolishing serfdom from above than to wait for it to begin to abolish itself from below. Pretty much the same thing that happened to the land question here in the tail end of the 19th century. And like here, the serfs had to pay their former landlord owners, and actually owners of the serfs, for the privilege of being so-called emancipated. But consequently, anyway, Russia industrialised much later than Western Europe and the USA, and when it did in the late 19th and early 20th century, it brought immense social and political changes. For example, the population of major cities of St. Petersburg and Moscow doubled in the 20 years between 1890 and 1910. You note know the name of the capital city then, St. Petersburg, which is the same as it is now. It was changed to Petrograd, when Russia went to war with Germany because somebody felt it was slightly unpatriotic to have your capital city having a German name when you were at war with Germany. So that's why St. Petersburg became Petrograd. The working class, which in 1865 was numbered at 700,000, by 1890 had reached 1.43 million and approximately 3 million by early 1900s. This was still only about 3% of the population. But Whereas it was a smaller working class, it was a fighting working class. In the capital of St. Petersburg, for example, there was a series of citywide strikes in the textile industry in 1896 and 1897. But still the overwhelming majority of the population, over 80% were peasants, 
living in subsistence conditions. An indication of these conditions can be gleaned from the fact that in 1900, 47% of children in rural areas did not survive the fifth birthday. So by the turn of the century, Russia, with a population of 130 million, mostly living in appalling conditions, was ripe for revolution. The 1904-05 war between Russia and Japan resulted in a heavy defeat for Russia with significant casualties, the destruction of its naval fleet and huge setback for its imperial aims in Asia. This was the first major military victory in the modern era of an Asian power over a European nation and was hugely damaging to Russia's internal prestige and to domestic morale. But things would go from bad to worse for the autocracy. In December 1904, sympathetic industrial action in support of a major strike in the Putilov plant in St. Petersburg involved a total of 150,000 workers in 382 factories. By January 1905, the city had no electricity and all public areas were closed. On the 22nd of January, thousands of peaceful protesters, led by a dubious priest, Father Gabon, who was reputed to be a police informer, went to the Winter Palace to deliver a petition to the Tsar, beseeching the Tsar as their little father, as he liked to be called, to ameliorate their lot. A massacre ensued when cavalry and Cossacks attacked the crowd with drawn swords and troops opened fire. Police reports at the time said that over 1,000 were killed and over 2,000 injured. This event became known around the world as Bloody Sunday and was regarded by many observers as final proof that Zara must be on reform, and this in 1905. General strikes followed in St. Petersburg and other major industrial centres throughout the empire. The Tsar promised that he would convene an elected assembly to advise the government. There was no such even consultative body in existence in the country before then. But this did not appease the striking workers or end the peasant rebellions which were spreading across the country. The revolt spread to non-Russian parts of the empire, such as Poland, Finland, Georgia, and the Baltic provinces. In some areas, the rebellion was met with violent attacks from a counter-revolutionary organisation called the Black Hundreds, who attacked socialists and organised pogroms against the Jews, a regular feature of Tsarist times. By the end of October 1905, over two million workers were on strike, and the army, having suffered shattering defeats at the hands of Japan, was increasingly restless. A hugely significant development, though perhaps not fully appreciated as such at the time, was the first appearance of Soviets or councils in early 1905. Initially set up as bodies to coordinate strike activities and enterprises, by the time of the general strike in October, the Petrograd Soviet consisted of between 400 and 500 delegates elected by around 200,000 workers around the city. Another auspicious development was the organisation of war, a workers' militia at factory level, which became known as the Red Guards. So I think the, we always boast that we had the first uh, workers' army in Europe. I think 1905, the factories in, in St. Petersburg might have had a little bit of a head start on the Irish citizen army, but we're happy to share the credit. Eventually, the revolution failed. And as much as it did not succeed in uprooting Tsarism and its corrupt hangers-on, or winning a majority of the army, but the seeds had been sown. The Tsar promised reforms and convened a Duma, a restrictive consultative parliament, but it took until early 1906 for the government to regain control of the army. Despite the Tsar's promises and some minor reforms, 1905 was followed by years of repression. But lessons were learned by the revolutionary forces. Lenin subsequently described the 1905 revolution as a dress rehearsal for 1917. The major organisation of revolutionaries at the time was the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party, no relation to the SDLP up north. And, and this was an underground Marxist party. It played a major role in the day-to-day -day struggles of the people of Russia and the growing development of illegal trade unions and of people's organisations which were legal, such as consumer cooperatives. The consumer cooperatives, by the way, had about 12 million members at the time of the revolution, which is extraordinary when you consider the population of the country. The trade unions, by the way, there were approximately t between three and four million industrial workers in Russia at the time of the revolution, and there were three million members of the trade unions. So almost every worker was organized within the trade union, and they bore little relationship, you'd be relieved to hear, to the social partnership um, creed of trade unions here at the moment. But as I said, the party played a major role in the legal and illegal struggles uh, of the working class. It also played an important role internationally, in the Second International. 
Second International was an organisation of working class parties in various countries, the successor to the Fourth International of Marx and Engels. All the major socialist parties were members. As is the way with the left, great debates took place in the international about the ways and means, the whys and the wherefores of the road to socialism. Eventually, two main trends emerged. Those who believed in steadily achieving reforms under capitalism until socialism was achieved, and those who believed that a revolutionary break of transformation was required to replace capitalism with socialism. Lenin was the main leader of the revolutionary element. These debates also took place within each party. The differences in the RSDLP came to a head in 1903 when two distinct factions emerged. The revolutionary element subsequently known as Bolsheviks and the reformist element known as Mensheviks. Now those names are very resonant and people who know little or nothing about the Russian Revolution will know about Bolsheviks and Mensheviks. But um, how the names come into existence is far more humdrum. There was an editorial board of the party paper and these big sharp ideological debates. There was a majority and a minority emerged and the word Bolshevik is drawn from the Russian word for majority, and the word Menshevik is drawn from the Russian word for minority. So Lenin and his Bolsheviks didn't mean they were a majority in the country, but they were a majority on the editorial board of the party paper. But that's where the words Bolshevik uh, and, and Menshevik come from. Um, <clears throat> Some years later, 1912, the split was formalised with the assignment of two separate parties. Bolshevik Party and Menshevik Party. Ultimately, the revolutionary forces renamed their party, the Bolshevik Party, and eventually the Communist Party, to distinguish themselves from the reformist elements who continued to use the names social democratic and socialist. That's something that has con continued to this day, hundreds of years um, on. This political and ideological split in the international workers' movement became critical in the lead up to the First World War. At the Congress of the Second International, all pre-war, all parties present had pledged to oppose any moves towards war on the part of the imperialist powers. But when war commenced, the great majority supported, quote, their own governments, encouraging workers to slaughter each other for the benefit of various branches of imperialism. At the Zimmerwald Conference of the International in 1915, um, <coughs> excuse me, in the second year of the war, Lenin and the Bolsheviks argued that as they had failed to stop the imperialist war, the key task now for the working class movement was to turn the imperialist war into a civil war. That is, to go to war against their own ruling class masters. There's echoes in this of Connolly's attitude and approach towards the 1916 rising, taking advantage of the imperialist war, the imperialist war to strike a blow for independence. <coughs> The attitude, this attitude to the imperialist war became the touchstone of the differences between revolutionary and reformist wings of the working class movement. World War I, from the point of view of Russia, was an absolute military, political and economic disaster for Russia. Despite its recent and extremely rapid rate of industrial development, Russia proved no match for highly industrialised Germany. Its casualties were greater than those suffered by any nation in any previous war. Two million dead and another five million wounded. Often troops were sent into battle with no boots, food, or sometimes even without weapons. For the civilian population, food and fuel shortages were exacerbated by undeveloped transport infrastructure and rampant inflation leading to near famine conditions. The so-called February Revolution, which is that kicked off on, by air reckoning, International Women's Day on the 8th of March, kicked off with huge demonstrations um, on that day, demanding bread and peace. As had happened in 1905, the army was called out to put down the demonstrations, but the troops wavered and couldn't be relied upon. In fact, most of the Petrograd garrison joined the revolt. Eventually, generals and some other officials approached the Tsar and asked him to abdicate. He tried to hand over to his brother, but his brother, who was maybe a bit more sense than most members of the Romanov family, said, no, thanks very much, you're all right and didn't take it. So after 300 years of rule by the Romanov dynasty, it disappeared in eight days. Eight days it took from the original uh, International Women's Day event started. Eight days later, the Tsar was gone. <laughs> Subsequently, a provisional government was appointed by Committee of the Duma, the Maya Parliament, basically made up of representatives or supporters of the capitalist class. But as John Reed, who wrote a classic book, Ten Days That Shook the World, which I'd recommend to anybody, and he didn't look like Warden Beatty, but for those of you who have seen the film Reds, I have to tell you the story about that film because it's a great story. 
Warren Beatty was one of the biggest stars in Hollywood, was very taken with this character, John Reed, who was an amazing character. He was a journalist, he was an eyewitness uh, uh, journalist, described the Mexican Revolution, he described the Russian Revolution, he was in Petrograd at the time. An extraordinary, vivid writer, you really get the sense that you're there if you read a, read a book. But anyway, Warren Beatty wanted to make this film. So we approached, I don't know, it was a Paramount, one of the big studios anyway, and said, look, give me some money, I want to get a film crew, and go down to Mexico, get some sites, and make this film about the Russian Revolution. I suppose whenever the big producer picked himself up on the floor with the shock, he's still one of the biggest stars in Hollywood, he could hardly say, go off and get yourself nothing. He said, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll give you $30 million. You get a camera crew, technicians, electricians, go down to Mexico, scout some sites, Spend a few, six months there, have some nice meals, have some nice drinks, and keep together 29 million and forget about the film. So, Beatty said, thanks very much, took the 30 million and went and made the film. And again, I'd recommend it, it's a brilliant film. It's over long, it's about three hours, but it's, it's a brilliant film and it, it really does capture it. Um, fair play to Warren Beatty anyway. But, um, <coughs> excuse me, the... As I said, uh, the, the provisional government that was appointed by a committee of the Duma, Duma was made up of capitalists and their representatives. John Reid, in his book, Ten Days They Shook the World, said, the property classes wanted merely a political revolution, which would take the power from the Tsar and give it to them. They didn't want any other change. They were quite happy with business as usual. They had no interest in acceding to the crowds in the streets, factories, fields and trenches. Best encapsulated in the Bolsheviks' memorable slogan, Peace, land and bread. Three words. Powerful, powerful slogan in revolutionary times. However, at this time, a rival organisation of the provisional government existed in the form of the Petrograd Soviet of workers and soldiers' deputies. The two and a half thousand delegates to this Soviet were elected by factories and military units in and around Petrograd. Sorry, I think I missed a bit that I say about Soviets. It means councils. It's just a Russian word for councils. These were councils that were set up in workplaces but um, it had grown enormously from the initial uh, council which had been set in Petrograd in 1905. So by 1917, the Petrograd Soviet of Workers and Soldiers deputies had two and a half thousand delegates elected by factories and military units in and around Petrograd. The Bolsheviks and their allies occupied government buildings and other strategic locations in Petrograd on March the 14th. Sorry, on March the 14th, the Soviet issued its famous order number one, directing the military to obey only the orders of the Soviet and not those of the provisional government. The provisional government was unable to countermand the order. On the 27th of March, the Petrograd Soviet issued a manifesto calling on all peoples to end the war. This extraordinary stand-up was known as the period of dual power, the period between the two revolutions of 1917. Despite the huge defeats and losses suffered by the army, the government was determined to continue the war. In one of many reshuffles of government which took place during the period, Prince Lvov invited representatives of the Petrograd Soviet, then dominated by the Mensheviks and an organisation called the Socialist Revolutionaries. That's my bleeding phone, apologies about that. Um, I blame people who told me to look things up on Google when I was trying to switch it off. Um, yeah, they, they, one of, uh, four or five different uh, administrations were formed in the first few months of 1970. One with this Prince Lvov invited representatives of the Petrograd Soviet to join the government. At the time, the executive of the Petrograd Soviet was dominated by Mensheviks and an organisation called Socialist Revolutionaries, which was uh, an agrarian party, party of, uh, of peasantry, of, uh, of middle peasants. The Bolsheviks at the time had 105 of the 822 delegates. Uh, so the, Bo the Bolsheviks had about one eight of the membership of the, the, the Petrograd Soviet at that time. To join <coughs> Kerensky, a leading Menshevik, joined the government who was involved in the Met Petrograd Soviet, joined the government as Minister for War. Not subtle. This is meant to be the organisation who were opposed to war and want an end to the war and want the army to withdraw from the war. And he goes and accepts not just a place in cabinet, but as uh, war minister for war on May the 18th. On the 4th of July, he ordered a massive but subsequently disastrous offensive, trying to make a name for himself. I think it was probably the last major offensive at that time of the Russian army. They took huge, huge casualties and huge losses. All this was having an effect 
back on the streets, back on the ranches, back on the land. And the 16th of July, a spontaneous demonstration of workers and soldiers broke out in Petrograd. Some army units there and in Moscow marched out under the slogan, All Power to the Soviets, and were joined by factory workers. On the 17th of July, a demonstration of 500,000 workers took place, supported by four to 5,000 Red Guards, a few hundred anarchist sailors, and 12,000 soldiers and low-ranking officers. Other demonstrations echoing their demands took place in Moscow and other cities. The Bolshevik leadership initially supported the demonstrations, but concerned that these events could be used by the government as a pretext for clampdown, instructed their members to participate in the demonstrations to ensure that they remained peaceful. The Melchevik and Socialist Revolutionary Leaders in Petrograd Soviet opposed the demonstrations and supported punitive measures against the demonstrations by the provisional government. Loyal army units were ordered to break up the demonstrations, resulting in 160 killed and 700 injured. Now, I said the Bolshevik party leadership, after initially endorsing the demonstrations, told the members to participate to make sure that they stayed peaceful because they were afraid it would be used as a provocation and excuse by the government to clamp down. The other concern was that Whereas many of those, and Bolsheviks and various other people of different parties and of none, were agitating for the Soviets to take power. Now, that was the slogan, all power, all power to the Soviets. And uh, there's one story that there was a, a conference of anarchists the day before this started, and that was the thing to organise this particular thing, which wouldn't surprise me greatly with anarchists. It's the type of thing to do. But the other concern that the Bolshevik leadership had was that clearly there was massive support in Petrograd for a revolutionary seizure of power. But I believe that did not extend around the country. It was not a nationwide phenomenon. And also, they did not have the support of key units um, of the army. So the view was, let's not push it, keep it safe. Kerensky used his, he was prime minister as well as minister for war, this stage, took advantage of the situation to order the arrest of Lenin and other Bolshevik uh, leaders. Lenin was able to escape. He didn't want to initially. He argued that he should stay and appear in court to defend the honour of his party because he was been accused of being a German agent in receipt of German money. The war was still going on, remember, between Russia and Germany. Excuse me. And Lenin, so offended Lenin's pride and integrity, he said he should go to the court and appear in court to defend his honour and the honour of the party. And um, other party leaders, including aforementioned Joe Stalin, said, don't be daft. You'll never get to court. They'll have you shot on your way. You know, shot while trying to escape or whatever. Probably quite right because that's what happened to other leaders. So he was eventually persuaded to change his hat, shave off his beard, change his coat, and he buggered off into the countryside um, in a place called Raslev, where he lived there for, for, for uh, a period of time as the revolution ripened. Other party members were arrested, um, including uh, Trotsky. And... Um, Kerensky then turned to General Kornilov, whom he had appointed as Commander-in-Chief of the Army on the 1st of August, asked him to come to Petrograd to restore order. Great expression with the bourgeois politicians, restore order, you know, it can mean a multitude. Basically, means kick them down there and keep them down there. Kornilov said, certainly, sure, he started to mobilise his army to march on Petrograd. However, it quickly became clear that he wasn't coming along to back up Kerensky or the provisional government. He was interested in establishing a military dictatorship with him as a numero uno himself. Um, Kerensky then chickened, as he tended to do, and made arrangements to release the Bolshevik leaders that had been imprisoned, and also to reissue arms to some units of the Red Guards whom the army had previously disarmed uh, to repel the threat of Colonel Love. Colonel Love's revolt lasted a couple of days and he was arrested and seized. And Kerensky, again through the farm, then wanted to not put the Bolsheviks back into jail, but take the guns back off the Red Guards and get everything back to square one. At this stage, it was too late. The drive was cast. Remember, at this time, the war is going on at the time with horrific casualties at the front and immense poverty and famine throughout the country. So everybody by Kerensky and his brother and his buddies was sick of it at this stage, and they were looking for leadership for who would show them a way out of this, how do you end the war? And the Bolsheviks, with their simple slogan, peace, land, and bread, was very, you can imagine, very attractive slogan. There was also the fact that 
The army was deserting in droves, by the way. They'd given up. The, the, the war, World War I was a beaten dog. They wanted to go home to their families. They wanted to participate in their form of land and get land for themselves and their families. Bear in mind the huge proportion, the huge preponderance of soldiers were actually uh, peasants. So the Bolsheviks then made arrangements. I should say, by the way, the time we're talking about here, when you come to late summer, September, October. I said it earlier on in the early summer, the Mensheviks and the Socialist Revolutionaries had been a majority when the Petrograd Soviet. They had 70% of the delegates. The Bolsheviks said 105 out of 820. By September, that had reversed itself. There had been a split in the Socialist Revolutionaries and the left wing had joined in alliance with the Bolshevik Party. So the left wing forces, Bolshevik and left Socialist Revolution, were now a majority of the Petrograd Soviet and could act accordingly. So arrangements were made to seize the main centres of government on the 7th of uh, November. And this is what happened. Just to make a point there, by the way, I t <coughs> excuse me. I spoke about it earlier, but the, 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 the Red Guards, they were significant forces this day by October. Um, starting off in small numbers, by the October Revolution, as they call it, they had 150,000 to 170,000 members in the Red Guards around the country, 25 to 30,000 of them in Petrograd, so a fairly significant force that combined with the, the disloyal and unsound army regiments who day and daily were coming over to the side of the revolution. It meant that there was a military force there which the provisional government could not oppose. So when the Soviets said, and the Bolshevik leaders organized to seize the key critical points the 7th of November, Kerensky basically wins and ran away. Um, that's not the way they put it in the, the history books, but that's about the size of it. Like, you know, we tried to mobilize some women's regiments and punitive regiments to fight against the, the, the revolution, but it was impossible. So we took as much loot as he could out of the treasury and legged it to Western Europe and subsequently to America. The Bolsheviks and their allies took power. They declared that the Petrograd Soviet, the Congress of People's Deputies, was now the ruling body of the country. And they set straight away about implementing a number of decrees. Uh, this comes as a shock for people here who think that what do politicians do? Election, they make promises. What did they do when they get elected? They ignore the promises. So we're in days. The second Congress of the Soviets opened on the 7th of November with a Bolshevik uh, majority. A decree on land was passed by that Congress on the 8th of November, the day after the assembly sat in session. A decree on land, nationalising the land, taking it away from the Tsar and the feudal lords and from the church and saying it was all going to be state property and would be allocated to peasants for the use that they could have a, a, a proper standard of living. On the same day, a decree in peace was passed by the Soviet, announcing that they wished to end the war and they wanted a just peace with no occupations, no indemnities for anybody that it should be a democratic and a just peace. So that was the, the second decree. Um, within a few days, there was a decree on an eight hour day. When people will talk to you here about all the joys we got from the so-called European Union and women's equality and social rights and everything else, the eight hour day came from Bumbuncha. Mucky revolutionary workers in Russia in November 1917. That's where it came from. That's where it came from. There was also a decree passed on popular education, providing for universal free education for everybody at all levels of education. In November, um, Lenin also drafted a memo declaring that the Petrograd Library should extend their working hours to facilitate people who were at work during the day and couldn't get into the libraries. On the 7th, 2nd of November, there was a declaration on the rights of the peoples of Russia, saying that all the different nationalities, I said Russia was known as the prison house of nations, all the different nations were in the Russian Empire, were given the right to uh, independence, should they wish to um, uh, avail of that. There was a decree on workers' control in enterprises on the 14th of November. For all industrial enterprises, the workers should elect uh, committees there to supervise management and to supervise the operations of the factory. In August 1918, the university was instructed to increase the number of students they enrolled and to favour the children of workers and poorer peasants. 
All of these measures and many more, it's important to note, were carried out whilst the young Soviet Republic dealt with the combined forces of native reaction and the armies of 14 capitalist countries dispatched to Russia in Churchill's wood to strangle the Bolshevik infant at birth. That included the United States, included Japan, included Britain. Like they all sent armies in there to strangle the Bolshevik infant uh, at birth. In doing so, they lined up with the most reactionary Tsarist forces, the Black Hundreds and everything else, to try to overthrow the Soviet government. This period is known as the Civil War, but I mean, it, it, like all civil wars, are very uncivil, but the foreign intervention, the arms of intervention, hardly gets a mention. Hardly gets a mention. Um, I was reading something there during the week, I think, was it Ronnie Reagan and some treatment with Gorbachev when they were sitting together to conspire to the, destroy socialism in the Soviet Union. Reagan was congratulating the Gorbachev said, our countries have never been at war against each other. And Gorbachev either didn't know his history, or didn't, the way, or didn't want to upset the new boss, but said actually the Americans had invaded Russia in 1918. Um, Kolchak, the Nick, and the big Tsarist generals all were backed up to the Hilton. Some appalling atrocities uh, were committed. I mean, tens of thousands of, of activists and militants, Bolsheviks and other uh, supporters of the revolution, not just Bolsheviks, were murdered out of hand by the reactionary forces. So by the time the Civil War ended in 1921, Russia was a country in ruin. Its economy was in a shambles, generating only one-seventh of the pre-war output. There had also been 14 and a half million deaths in the previous six years. So, very often you'll get people talking about what happened and what didn't happen in, in, in Soviet Russia and about the standards of living. And they don't have any regard to where was the starting point? Where did Soviet Russia start from? They started from a position where their industrial production was one seventh of what had been in 1913, and it was hardly an advanced industrial power in 1913. It took until the 1930s for Soviet Russia to recover that level of industrial output. The five-year plans and collectivization of agriculture helped them to gather strength, all the time providing these basic social supports, which are the envy of workers in any capitalist country. I managed to do that all the time while they rebuilt the economy to get themselves ready for the next ultimate test which they would face, which was the invasion of um, Nazi Germany. I'm going to stop at that because I've been talking long enough, but I have one little point here maybe to, to finish on. Donald spoke about the situation in Ireland, the so-called what's now fashionable to call the revolutionary years. Um, I think very often we'd be celebrating the counter-revolutionary years, not the revolutionary years, and see what was actually happening. But what was the difference between Russia, where they carried through a successful revolution in the face of the most appalling odds and enormous sacrifice, but they carried through a successful revolution? And look what happened here. We had a successful counter-revolution. And say, so you had spontaneous struggles such as the ones of instance in Russia, and said so I stayed away from the whole thing, the, gener the, the, the leaders, commissar, comrade, this, 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 that, the other, folks, and the mass movement of people, which is what the Russian Revolution was about. You had similar struggles here. You had spontaneous struggles, strikes, land seizures, occupations, which was such a feature of the so-called revolutionary years in this country. What happened to it? Apart from some that they're, they're hidden and buried in the history books, what happened? How were the people of Russia able to carry through a successful revolution, such enormous odds, and it didn't happen here? Now, I have my own view on it, as a member of the Communist Party, I would have, is because there was an absence in Ireland of a revolutionary leading force, such as, not necessarily, but such as the Communist Party, who would understand the relationship between the different classes, the forces at play, and give clear, consistent and principled leadership to the people in the way that Lenin and the Bolsheviks did um, in the periods that I've mentioned. That, I think, is the main key thing that was missing in this country. The great tragedy, of course, was the murder of James Connolly in 1916, because Connolly was the great hope, I think, of the Irish working class, who could combine theory and practice who was a profound internationalist as well as a profound patriot, 
and I think that his loss is incalculable. No one person's loss affects history totally, but I think it was a huge, given that the revolutionaries were so thin on the ground, real revolutionaries the first place, I think Connolly's loss was, uh, was a huge loss here, and the loss of people like Lee Mellows and Sean McLaughlin, people who had to emigrate and whatnot. I'll leave it there. Thanks very much for your attention, Thomas. Okay, so the story is one raffle, two raffle. Anyone wants a ticket to see Kieran or Tony? Uh, I'd like to say a big thank you to Eddie and Donald. That was absolutely wonderful. And I hope everyone goes over here knowing a little bit more than they did when they came in, because I know I will. Thank you all very much. If anyone has a question, put your hand up and we'll get the ball rolling. John? Were they as anti-communist, you know, in the early stages of the kind of the Russian Revolution? Or did they have an understanding of did they have a, did they have a position of having that? Uh, great question, yeah, great question. Uh, at that meeting in the Mansion House in 1918, the reports on that meeting are the, the newspapers, they know it's a big event, like there's 10,000 people there. So the Irish Times and Window, they basically reprint every word that said that meeting. The reports are massive. But Captain Lynn speaks, she's from the, the, the Citizen Army, and she's a 1960 veteran, Dr. Kathleen Lynn. And she speaks near the very end of it. And what she says is brilliant. She says, oh, you know, we've, we've a lot of people here today, but once this is condemned by the clergy, and once we're told that the revolution in Russia is a revolution against the clergy, we'll see this movement come under attack. So even in February 1918, there was a sense among the left that if the church were to condemn what had happened in Russia, it would, it would lead them to a bad place. There was, yeah, there was the likes of that pamphlet, Red Tower in Green, which had some kind of um, quotes from, from concerned bishops and the like. But really, it's, it comes later. The, 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 the rabbit <coughs> anti-communism comes later. And what it's inspired by, really, is I suppose it's, it, it's Mexico, but to a much greater extent, it's Spain. And it's really Spain that triggers the mass hysteria. And there are people, even in the Catholic Church, I mean, there's, there's um, that, that, that great hero, his name, Michael, Pater Michael Flanagan. Father Michael O'Flanagan is, 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 is a priest who supports the Irish Republic and later the Spanish Republic when it matters, but he's very, very much in a, in a minority. But the, the, the rabbit anti, like the St. Patrick's Anti-Communist League, what a great name, that's set up in, uh, in March 1933. It really is, it's a combination of coming to Gael and losing power, and Fianna Fáil coming to power, and what happens in Spain and Mexico that triggers the anti-communism. So it comes a little, a little later. Anyone else questions? There has to be some. <coughs> Just a question for Eddie there. The, the Black um, 100s, would they, would they be like the, an early form of fascist organisation, like of a militant group that would be, because uh, they were anti Jewish and anti communist? Like? Well, it was pre, pre fascism days. I mean, fascism as a phenomenon didn't exist in the time, but I mean, yeah. they were Zardists, they were supporters of Zardism, okay? Um, they were the most profoundly reactionary organisation going. I mean, they, they, they would make the blue shirts look positively moderate. Like, you know, as I said, their stock and trade was, was pogroms, and they were at the disposal of the, the landed uh, aristocracy, the church and Zardism, to beat down any risings or uprisings or trouble, trouble at mill that they would encounter. I mean, I didn't make it very clear. When I'm talking about Russia and the... 1800s and into 1900s, every second day of the week there was a little uprising or rebellion going on somewhere. There was peasant revolts all over the country, all over the country, pretty well all the time. I mean, the conditions that the people lived in was absolutely appalling. And the black hundreds were the, the bulwark of reaction to keep, to keep the peasantry in place, and particularly any socialists that came across. They were just butchered and, and, and killed, killed out of hand. What kind of society would the members come from? I, I would say, I'm not, a, I'm not an authority on it now, I have to tell you, but I mean, looking at the, the character of the organisation, you would assume that the minor figures in the gentry and the landowner and the aristocracy, I mean, they tend to be the ones like, you know, the... <coughs> The big landowners, they're the ones with the land. It's the younger brother who didn't get it. They want to go off and cause a bit of mischief and make a name for himself. Whether it's going out into Africa, killing fuzzy wuzzies, for as they call them, for the British Empire, or beating up the local Jewish people to foment a bit of sectarian hatred. 
the, I would say that was probably the main social composition of them would be the, the, the junior landed gentry. The same as like the, the squirties that you had made up an awful lot of the yeomanry here in, in 1798. I'd say fairly similar social composition. But see, Rainer Lloyd said that from the historian sitting there, Rainer can add a bit of information, I'm sure, to that. Well, I certainly cannot um, give you the sort of composition of the uh, class composition of the Black Hundred. I don't uh, claim to, 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 know, to know it. I know, uh, you know how it d d developed. Um, and I think you're, you're probably right that it would be guys who, um, <coughs> you know, were, were the people who would be most uh, worried, uh, they weren't, they, uh, there had been an inadequate land reform in Russia, of course, uh, started by, I think you mentioned Tsar Alexander II. Um, uh, they'd lost chances of land, um, but so they began to look to the state, would have looked to the state uh, for, the Tsarist state for support. And, uh, you know, they'd uh, show themselves more Tsarist, if you like, than the Tsar by picking up Jews. That would probably be the um, rationale. I will say, of course, that many of the Black Hundreds uh, escaped from Russia after the revolution, and many of them went to Germany, and they had, uh, if they had any money, many of them would give it to the rising party called the National Socialist Party, headed by a man called Hitler. So there is a, a direct connection between, between, between them. Just one point, as you have given me the something of the floor. I think, uh, Donald, you say uh, it started the uh, church uh, opposition. The church, you could see it in the Lenten pastorals in 1919, that particularly, I think, uh, Cardinal uh, Logue's pastoral was uh, is one in which he sort of warns warns against drilling, uh, which is the main thing in IRA, and uh, also against the dangers of socialism and communism. And uh, uh, but uh, it was overshadowed until the end of the twenties by um, uh, though it were, they were never going to be the, Russia was never going to be the flavour of the month with the hierarchy. Um, it was overshadowed by Mexico where it was a determined uh, bourgeois struggle, and it was, this was reflected. Uh, uh, it turned around in 1929, when uh, I think, the, to a certain extent, it was because the, the, the Russian state uh, extended its uh, secularism considerably uh, to, um, uh, and, uh, and um, in order to, uh, Attack the to, to 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 attack religion more fervently than it had before, and that uh, was, and since the Mexican re struggle against the church was was declining, the the church found it was was absolutely uh, t time to attack the Russians, uh, and that was sort of part of it. You find it there, and of course then in 1932 there was the Eucharistic Congress, and you know that really put a seal on it. So. Um, that would, would would be it. But as to the as to the who were the, the Black Hundred, sort of they were would be the uh, of course a lot of the lump the lumpen proletariat, the uh, the smaller um, the, the, the smaller bourgeoisie and landowners. You know they would, would, would the people the insec the the people who are insecure and not prepared to uh, analyse why they were insecure would be, would be the people. Just in terms of Russian uh, reactionaries where they ended up, I know Padre Golgo Rourke, a historian down in Clare, he's done a bit of work on the uh, auxiliary cadets of the RIC, mm -hmm. who are better known to be in you as the Black and Dance, and a couple of Russian names in their ranks as well. Like, so it's, it's interesting that some white Russians have played no small role in trying to crush the revolution in Russia end up in the ranks of the Black and Tans, which isn't surprising, you know, given British intervention uh, in, in, in Russia. There's a few of them, there's a few of them on, the, on the Black and Tan books. There's huge numbers of, uh, of Russian reactions as well. After the defeat of the so-called Civil War and the White Armies, which is what the opposition were called, huge numbers went, Renner Sampert also went to Germany, huge numbers went to, for example, Canada. 
There's an immense number of particularly Ukrainian emigrants, very big Ukrainian emigrant community in Canada. And many of them come over there originally after fighting on the losing side in the red and white battles in the Russian Civil War. And many more of them, even Nazi breed, went out there after fighting for the Nazis in World War II and helping the murder the wrong people. An awful lot of them found uh, a sucker and refuge in, in Canada and in the United States. So, I mean, it's not, an, it's not a new phenomenon. It's a long-standing phenomenon, that one. Any more questions? <laughs> yes. Go ahead. Yeah, um, just, you mentioned, Donald mentioned Patrick McCartan, um, and you said he was quite conservative, I'm sure you're right, but he was also, during the treaty debates, he actually, even though he eventually did vote the treaty, he had some uh, very good anti-imperialist rhetoric in yeah, it. And yeah, then also, yeah. uh, obviously, James Larkin, who hasn't been mentioned too much, but obviously uh, very revolutionary, but also had a good relationship with certain church figures. So I'm just wondering if you'd comment a little bit about kind of this period in history, of why there's these weird ideological tie-ups where... Some people, they look kind of sound on something and then they're not on something else. Patrick McCartan is very shaped by his time in America. And he's coming into contact with a whole range of different groups in in New York City. Like Puerto Rican nationalists are there, for example. Ireland in the revolutionary world is very, very interesting. And in terms of the US, I think he's he's coming into contact with a lot of kind of left separatists from right across the world. New York is the place to go if you're trying to build international links in that sense. And he's come into contact also, I mean, people like Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, the Wobblies are there too, mm-hmm. and they're quite close to some of what's happening in Irish America. So I think McCartan certainly, yeah, definitely, the, the people he was around in America may have influenced uh, how we thought about politics over time. Larkin, yeah, Larkin's Larkin. Larkin has his own political philosophy, and it's a strange mix of all kinds of things, Larkinism. But it's, it's, it's not so much an ideological uh, political philosophy as it is just, it's the shouting arms and the voice of Larkin. And Larkin is, as, as, in some ways, as influenced by the Bible <laughs> as he is by, by left-wing texts. And his ego. And his ego. Let's not forget that. He always reminds me of Big Bill Haywood and the Wobblies. You know, Big Bill Haywood said, I've never read Marx's Capital, but I have the Marx of Capital all over my body. And Larkin was, Larkin was a bit like that as well. <laughs> of course, uh, Larkin was a founder member of the, of the American Communist Party. I mean, you know, so I suppose it shows how eclectic it was at that time. Um, probably the worst thing Larkin did when he came back was to try to displace the struggling mm. Communist Party of Ireland and set up his own very much looser Irish Worker League, but that's another story. Anyone else? No more? Yeah? yeah uh, just, from, just on the connection between Irish bosses and the fleshing Soviet state, I remember hearing something that the provisional government pops to be around 1920 or so. Negotiated a loan for 20,000 to sure. Yeah, yeah. That is true. Isn't that it? comes out of the States as well. Uh, they're, like the, they're selling Republican bonds in the States. I think we always read history backwards. Probably the most famous Irishman in the world during the War of Independence is not Michael Collins, who's leading the kind of clandestine war. It's Eamon de Valera. Because de Valera is travelling right across the, the US yeah. and he's selling these Republican bonds and he's meeting Native American tribes one day and Puerto Ricans the next. And his name is known in every newspaper in the States, de Valera. And it means that they're, they're raising very large sums of money in America. I mean, they're, they're able to finance, basically the Thompson submachine gun comes off the production lines in New York because the Irish have the money to, to get it there. But also there is a problem for the Russians in terms of raising money in the States. And this loan, these Irish, the, the Russian parts of the Russian crown jewels are provided as, as collateral against the loan of, I think, $20,000, which in the money of the day is extraordinary money. Mm-hmm. They end up in Dublin in Harry Boland's family. They're in Marino. In, in the family house, they're up the, up the, up the chimney. And, and basically the family were told not to hand them back uh, until there was a Republican government. So when Fianna Fáil came in the 30s, the Bowling family arrived with the Russian Reds. <laughs> and they're, they're eventually given back. And there is a letter actually from the, from the, the, the Russian embassy in, in London, written to, to the government buildings in Dublin. But it's a weird moment, but it did happen. It's actually true. Yeah, the $20,000 loan for the Russian graduates. It's collateral. Can you not? Okay, we're rough, no, thanks all very much for coming.